The secretary reiterated his heartfelt gratitude to the emirs, indispensable and, all, and quite frankly, ongoing support to our efforts uh, uh, to continue to get Americans and our Afghan allies out of Afghanistan. The leaders discussed shared regional security interests, de-escalating tensions in the region, countering terrorism, and of course the full scope of threats represented by Iran. Secretary Austin shared his vision for integrated deterrence, emphasizing the importance of multilateral efforts and integrated operations with partners like Qatar to address threats confronting the region. I think uh, speaking of threats in the region, earlier this morning, U.S. military personnel responded to an inbound missile threat on the UAE. This involved the activation of Patriot missile batteries coincident with the efforts by the armed forces of the UAE. The combined efforts successfully engaged the threat and there were no injuries or casualties. We commend the pro professionalism of the UAE armed forces in confronting these threats and defending their territory. We, of course, stand with uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and our Gulf partners in defending against threats to their peoples and their territories. And with that, we'll take questions. I think, Bob, you're on the line, yeah? Bob, you there? Okay, uh, nothing heard. Um, we'll go in the room. Funny. Uh, yeah, John, I want to just follow up on, on the meeting today between the Secretary and the uh, of Qatar. Um, the President just uh, said um, while welcoming the Amir of Qatar that he will um, notify the Congress about his intent to designate Qatar as a major non-NATO ally. Can you, can you explain the significance of this designation? How would it help further the defense relationship between Qatar and the U.S.? Thank I mean, it, it opens up a whole new range of opportunities of uh, defense relationships. I mean, not just with the United States bilaterally, but with uh, other allies. Uh, and certainly I'd let other nations speak for themselves and, and their own bilateral defense relationships with, with Qatar. But it does open up um, a full new range of, of opportunities, <coughs> exercises, operations, uh, um, and, you know, perhaps um, uh, the application of of you know acquisition of capabilities as well. So, um, uh, it's uh, I mean the secretary was was honored and pleased to to be able to to, to make that pledge and obviously we'll we'll see where it goes. And and uh, on the attack today uh, yesterday on on uh, the Emirates, the president just said he directed Secretary Austin to offer um, America's support to allies, specifically Saudi Arabia and and UAE. And he said, I'm quoting him. Uh, America will have the backs of our friends in the region. Are there any specific uh, new support that the U.S. is uh, planning on providing to these two nations? I don't have anything uh, specific, Fadi, to, to announce today. Um, but uh, and, and the attack was actually today. Um, uh, I don't have anything specific to announce with respect to additional capabilities. But I would tell you that we are constantly looking, um, even before this spate of recent attacks, but certainly in the wake of them. Uh, for uh, additional capabilities that might uh, prove useful uh, to our Gulf partners, in this case, particularly the, the Emirati. So, again, nothing to announce today in terms of something moving, uh, but very much uh, committed to having um, a, very, a very discreet and specific conversation with the Emiratis about uh, what they might need and what we might be able to provide. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Bob, I'll come back to you again. Did you, did you get there? Yeah, apologies for that. I, I had muted myself. Sorry. Um, question about the uh, stateside units that are on prepared to deploy orders for Europe. Um, President Biden said on Friday that he said, well, what he said exactly was, I'll be moving troops to Eastern Europe and the NATO countries um, in the near term. So the, it, it seemed from that that the decision to do this has already been made. It was only a question of when. And so can you say what would trigger that deployment to Europe um, from the U.S. aside from the activation of the NATO response force? Thanks. Well, um, the NATO response force and what I and, and what the president was referring to uh, aren't necessarily the same thing. The NATO has to vote on activation of the response force. I mean, that's something that would have to come from 
uh, from the alliance it, itself, and that hasn't occurred. Um, we have shortened the uh, alert status uh, for more than 8,000 uh, U.S. troops, but uh, and they're and they're making the preparations that they need now to be able to meet that shorter tether. But there's been no decision to activate it. As for uh, uh, the addition of of uh, forces or capabilities in, into the eastern flank of NATO, you heard the president uh, make very clear uh, what his intentions are. I don't have any announcements to make today. I don't have any units to talk about. But uh, as I've said, and frankly, I've said it now for a couple of weeks, uh, we're we're going through the rigorous work of providing options for the commander in chief should he ch decide to do that, um, uh, where and when he decides to do that. Obviously, in close consultation with the actual allies themselves. I mean, you can't just unilaterally decide to to, to throw extra U.S. forces at, at a country. You want to ha make sure that uh, that they're on board with it and that you've had the appropriate conversations. And uh, what I would tell you is that those sorts of conversations are ongoing. Um, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at there. I, I d leave it at that. I, I don't again have. A timeline to give you. I, I certainly don't have any specifics with respect to a, a redeployment inside uh, Europe um, to, to talk to in any great detail. But it is very much an active uh, discussion here at the Pentagon. It certainly um, is an active discussion that we're having with our National Security Council uh, counterparts, as well as, and this is really important to remind, with, with our allies themselves. Court. Um, I, I'm unclear on two things. Okay, so what, what President Biden was talking about then is a unilateral deployment to NATO ally countries around Ukraine, right? That's yes. what you're saying. Okay. Why, what's, I, I know we've heard about, you know, bolstering NATO defense, partner defenses and Article 5 commitment, but the one thing I'm still unclear on is like, is there any indication that Russia is threatening or, or is, is, has any plans at all to invade any of the NATO allies around Ukraine? Because it seems like everything we're hearing is that the threat is to Ukraine. So mm -hmm. what's the Article 5 commitment mm -hmm. that the U.S. has to allies around there? Mm -hmm. Or is it really just about showing, like, a, a, a demonstration of force? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a fair question. Um, I think, uh, and you can see it in, in press reporting out of Europe, that uh, that the... Russian buildup around Ukraine and in Belarus has definitely got many of our NATO allies concerned, particularly those allies that border or are very close to bordering Russia. Um, and uh, what we want to make sure is we, we know that, that, that uh, I mean, Putin has said himself uh, how concerned he is about NATO um, and this false belief that it's somehow an offensive alliance aim to contain Russia or to uh, threaten Russia. Again, false. Uh, but this is the narrative he's putting out there. Um, and so we want to make sure that our NATO allies understand we take seriously our commitments to them. And so if they desire, if they want uh, additional capabilities, particularly in those eastern flank countries, um, to bolster their own self-defense, then we want to have that conversation with them and we want to be willing to provide that for them. That's the unilateral movements, and it really is designed to ensure NATO solidarity and, quite frankly, to help bolster the capabilities of our allies. Second and distinct from that, of course, is the NATO response force. So this is a 40,000 uh, uh, troop strong response force that only NATO, the, the alliance, can activate. We have obligations inside that, just like uh, other countries inside the alliance, we signed up for a, a certain amount of contribution to that. Um, it is not something that is um, uh, that's just off the shelf and you just go grab it. So you, you want to make it as, sh as short a tether as possible, and that's why we've alerted those extra 8,500 troops here in the States. They have not been given deployment orders. Uh, they've just been told to be ready on a shorter period of time uh, in case the alliance activates that. Um, and as for Ukraine, you're right. The, the principal threat right now, at least from a military perspective, is from Russia on Ukraine uh, and to Ukrainian soil, which is why we continue to uh, provide security assistance material to the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, another shipment just arrived on Friday. There will be more coming in coming days. Uh, and why we still have trainers on the ground. 
uh, not just us, the Brits do, the Canadians do, trainers on the ground to help uh, improve the competence and the confidence of Ukrainian armed forces. So it's really, it's really a multi-tiered approach here. Uh, but the president has been very clear. We're not going to see American troops on the ground in combat with the Russians in Ukraine. Um, uh, he has made clear that that's not on the table. So what we're focused on is the, the, the very real security commitments that we have you mentioned under Article 5 specifically to our NATO allies. Um, should Mr. Putin decide to make or to exhibit threats against the alliance, we want to make sure that he understands unequivocally that that's not going to be acceptable and the United States will will fight to defend our, our NATO allies and our, our commitments uh, to our allies uh, on the continent. But look, again, um, and pardon me for, for going on, um, but it was a very good question. Uh, we don't think it has to come to conflict. Uh, there's still, we still believe there's time and space for diplomacy. You actually heard a little bit about from the Russians themselves, that they're still willing to, to talk. So we believe that in that time and space, we, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to, to be ready, just in case there was a need by our NATO allies, but also to allow for that time and space for diplomacy to occur. Did that answer you? Tom. You talk a little bit about Russia, and are you still seeing Russia move in troops and material? Yes. And can you get specific on what you're seeing? And also as far as possible naval movements in the Mediterranean uh, heading perhaps toward the Bosphorus? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to continue to be circumspect about uh, intelligence assessments and what we're seeing, Tom. But uh, broadly speaking, we continue to see, even over the course of the weekend, additional U.S. I'm sorry, additional Russian uh, ground forces uh, move in uh, again uh, in Belarus and around the border with Ukraine. As you heard uh, General Milley say on Friday, these are combined arms capable forces. So it's not just infantry, for instance, it's artillery. It's, it's, um, it's air defense. Um, he's got a full range of military capabilities available to him, which only continue to increase the number of options available to him, whether if, if he decides to move uh, militarily. We have seen increasing uh, naval activity in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic uh, by uh, Russian fleet vessels, um, uh, and we're watching that uh, pretty closely. Uh, nothing hostile necessarily to report to or to speak to, uh, but they have... Um, they have uh, put to sea more ships. They are exercising at sea. They are, are, are clearly um, increasing the, the capabilities they have at sea should, should they need it. So, again, all this goes, you know, I, all this goes to options available to Mr. Putin. Um, and he continues to create more options for himself from a military perspective. Again, we want him to see him, we want to see him exercise a diplomatic option, which, oh, by the way, is also still open to him. Do you get any indication those ships are heading toward the Bosphorus, though? I yeah, mean, I'm going to... an agreement that, that kicks in that they have to give you yeah. know, notice that they're going to head, uh, uh, transit the Bosphorus? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to refrain from speaking about specific... Uh, movements of their naval vessels. I think that's a great question for the Russian Navy, and uh, and they should have to speak for what they're doing and where they're going, like way that the way that we do. Um, but uh, what I would just say is, I'll leave it at increased naval activity, which is concerning. Orin. Two questions. One a follow up to Courtney. Um, have NATO allies requested a unilateral deployment of U.S. troops to their countries? We are in active discussions with a number of allies about um, U.S. capabilities that they might desire might, and, might, uh, and might ask for. Um, but again, I don't have any final decisions to speak to today. And the second question on North Korea, they fired an intermediate range ballistic missile. Um, are you considering or prepared for the possibility that they fire an intercontinental ballistic missile? And does it affect U.S. force posture exercises, anything of that extent, should they choose to go that route? Well, I don't want to hypothesize about the future launches. We're obviously always looking at our force presence, our force posture, uh, our force protection uh, there on the peninsula and in the region, um, and also constantly looking at uh, our own readiness from a, a, from a training event perspective. And all that is factored in, what we see coming out of Pyongyang, all that factors into our decision making. I would tell you that we obviously take our force protection very, very seriously, but also the need to be ready. Uh, and so nothing's changed about uh, nothing's changed about uh, our desire to work closely with our South Korean allies 
on force readiness there on the peninsula. Um, as for what he may do next, only Kim Jong-un knows the answer to that. What we hope he does next is stop these launches, stop these provocations, abide by U.N. Security Council resolutions, and quit threatening his neighbors in the region. Um, we have made it very clear as an administration that we're willing to sit down and have dialogue with the North Koreans without precondition. That offer, is still, that offer still stands. But in the meantime, here at the Department of Defense, we're going to do what we have to do to be ready on the peninsula. Janie. Yeah. I'm surprised you're going to follow up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, North Korea wants that uh, this missile could hit the U.S. mainland directly. What is the uh, Secretary Austin's reaction to the North Korea threat to the U.S. mainland? I pretty much just gave that answer. Um, uh, look, we're, I'm, I'm not going to speak about uh, intelligence assessments of each and every launch. Uh, we. We understand he's conducting these launches. Um, um, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to get inside his mind as to exactly what he's doing and why. I mean, some of it could be message signaling, but you know what? We also have to assume that it's that it's learning, that it's improving, that that uh, no matter how well or how poorly these launches go, he learns from them, and he's able to, you know, continue to advance his program. And so. To your point, yes, the secretary is very concerned uh, about their advancing uh, uh, ballistic missile program. Uh, and that is why, again, we're, we're focused on making sure that we have the right capabilities available to us and to our allies in the region. Again, um, the U.S. wants uh, diplomacy and uh, dialogue with North Korea without the precondition. You say that many times. I have said that, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, but uh, if North Korean Kim Jong-un wants a different path, is the U.S. ready to go the other way? What other way? I mean, different way to go, because well, if, well, like, I, exactly, I, I, I mean, your other I, I don't know what other ways he might be considering. All I can tell you is we still believe uh, that uh, that diplomacy is the right way. And we have made it very clear repeatedly that we're willing to sit down and have those discussions. And that's what, that's what we'd like to, to see occur. Um, so I don't know that it would be very valuable to speculate one way or the other about other courses of action here. Clearly, nobody wants to see this come to open conflict. Um, uh, that would be uh, devastating for everybody. Uh, on the peninsula and, and certainly uh, elsewhere in the region. And there's no reason that it has to come that way. But in the meantime, while our diplomats are hard at work trying to advance some sort of dialogue, we here in the Department of Defense have got to make sure we're constantly advancing the capabilities of the alliance. And that's what we're focused on. You interview with the Fox News. I, think uh, I, I did, said, yes. Yeah, so you have uh, maybe, you have some options to uh, the other way, I mean, military options or something? No. How does my interview with Fox News me mean that I have additional military options to speak to? Yeah, I, I, you didn't say the exactly what the military options saying, but you can you have the other way. That means you got many options, but you can choose some options. We um, continue to explore and improve military capabilities on the peninsula in concert with our South Korean allies. Some of them are very easy to see and to demonstrate, and, and we talk about them, and some of them we don't. Uh, but uh, un until there is a, a, a peaceful denuclearization of the peninsula, we have an obligation to be ready, and that's what we're focused on right now. Gordon. I forget about the Fadi's question, Qatar, um, and you may not know this, but uh, does designating Qatar as a non-NATO ally is that a requirement to do some of the things you mentioned, like the exercises and the acquisition, potentially, or, or is it just? Kind it would of be like a requirement inside the alliance. And again, it's 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 not our decision to make. Uh, it, it's simply that you know we support that process, uh, but it would be a decision for the alliance to make. And and what you what comes out of that. And again, I encourage you to speak to our NATO colleagues in more detail about this. But it does open up uh, opportunities of cooperation with the alliance and inside uh, the alliance regimen. Two hours to include uh, U.S., so more arms sales, more... Those are bilateral 
decisions made by sovereign states. So they don't not necessarily have to do with this designation? I, I wouldn't think so. Uh, let me go back to the phones. Uh, Phil? Uh, hey there. Just following up on the uh, on the Houthi uh, missile attack on, on UAE, can you you said that the uh, that the U.S. forces uh, uh, fired Patriots? Did the Patriots intercept the the incoming uh, missile, and or, or was it some other capability that, that did that? And then also, you know, uh, what do you think uh, is the threat? These, these are repeated attacks on U.S. forces. What is the threat, and do you believe the U.S. is positioned uh, to 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 deal with a threat that is, you know, these are weekly attacks now. Well, I think just um, you never want to take anything for granted, Phil, but clearly um, uh, these attacks have have uh, um, have not been 100 percent successful. We continue to, as I said to Fadi, explore opportunities to improve our, our defenses and uh uh, and the defenses of our Emirati uh, partners as well. So I, I don't have an announcement to make in terms of what we're going to do differently. We're constantly trying to make sure that we're, uh, that we're more ready. My understanding uh, with respect to this particular attack is that uh, the inbound missile was engaged by Emirati uh, uh, surface-to-air missiles. Uh, they, 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 they are the ones that actually engaged this missile, uh, the U.S. Patriots, uh, were fired, but it was the Emirati uh, surface-to-air missiles that actually engaged the targets. Um, John, I know I asked two questions, but, but may, may I clarify something with you on this? Mm -hmm. uh, in the first uh, in the first instance, when the U.S. used the Patriot, I think that was last Monday, um, the inbound missiles were targeting a Dafra Air Base. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did the U.S. forces activate the Patriot this time as well because of uh, Dafra was the target? Uh, I, what I can tell you is the Patriots were engaged. Um, um, I, I don't have anything more detailed to speak to in terms of actual target, but the Patriots were, our Patriots were engaged. So is, is the policy now that, I'm trying to understand something, uh, are U.S. forces um, engaging these attacks when they are targeting Al Dafra Air Base where the U.S. forces are stationed or to defend the UAE in general against attacks? I mean, Every, every attack is different, Fadi, so I, I don't want to put some blanket policy on it, but obviously we're going to help come to the defense of our Emirati partners. Regardless of the target. If, if we can help defend our Emirati partners, we're going to do that. Yeah. Nobody else here. Let me go back. Uh, Jeff Shogel. Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify the unilateral NATO deployment that President Biden mentioned on Friday is that in addition to the 8,500 U.S. troops that have been put on prepared to deploy orders as part of the NATO response force? If so, how many more troops are we talking about? Jeff, essentially the answer to your question is yes. The 8,500 troops that we talked about last week uh, are part of our contribution to the NRF. The NRF has not been activated. What the president was talking about was uh, the potential for additional U.S. troops to bolster the capabilities of some of our eastern flank NATO allies. Um, uh, the, I don't have a specific uh, announcement to make with respect to that in terms of how many, uh, where they would come from, or what country they might or countries they might go to. Uh, when we have something to speak to like that, we'll obviously talk to you about it. But as I said at the outset, we're an active uh, consultations with allies about the needs. So uh, right now, we just don't have something specific to speak to, but that's what the president was referring to. The other thing I might just remind, and again, this is nothing new, I've said this before, uh, is that an, an option available to us uh, is to use uh, U.S. forces that are already in the European uh, theater. Uh, you don't necessarily have to flow in uh, forces from the states or from even other theaters. We have a, you know, tens of thousands of, uh, of U.S. troops uh, on European soils, both in a, a permanently based uh, uh, environment as well as uh, on rotational orders. Uh, and so we're taking a look at the whole menu of opportunities av available here uh, and units available. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll work that out individually with each, with each NATO ally as appropriate. Well, I know you don't have number. Can you ballpark it? Can you say hundreds, thousands? Yeah, Jeff, I'm just not going to be able to do that right now. I mean, I, I certainly understand the the uh, the interest in that. Um, what I would tell you is that as we have an, uh, an arrangement to speak to, 
we'll speak to it, and I'll, uh, we'll try to be uh, as completely forthcoming uh, as we can be uh, on the, the details of it, just like we were last week on the, on the prepare to deploy contingent. But I don't have a, I don't have a, I w it would be inappropriate for me, uh, since we're in active discussions with allies, for me to, to ballpark it right now. Court. I, I thought that there was a small contingent, like a fraction of the 8,500 that would be part of the unilateral, and that, but now it's, so now it's, is all 8,500 would be potentially? I mean, the, your as I said back then, the vast majority of that 8,500 were for the NATO response. But then there's some in addition to that now, according. For there, what, there, there are, there are, uh, there are some. Uh, forces uh, that are being uh, put on uh, heightened alert here in the United States uh, that that could be used in a more unilateral way or a bilateral way is really the best way to put that. Uh, but again, I just don't have anything specific to speak to. The vast, vast majority of the ones we've already talked to are about are designed for the NATO response force. So I'm just trying to understand if we're talking about now more than 8,500 that are on prepared to deploy for, for both when you consider both the NATO and the unilateral. Am I misunderstanding it? I don't know. I maybe I'm. I think I'm misunderstanding okay. it. There's a, there's 8,500. The vast majority would go to the NATO response force if it's activated. Yeah. There's a fraction of those, some some portion of those that would potentially be used unilaterally. Potentially, yeah. But then there is now there's an even additional, in, in, beyond that, who might be used unilaterally. Is that what? We're, yeah. yeah. Um, but what I'm talking about, in answer to Jeff's question, is is they could come from inside the European continent as it is, okay. and. General Walters can make decisions about whether to, you know, put them on a heightened alert or not. Um, and obviously, uh, he's working his way through those those kinds of uh, uh, decisions right now. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is that when it comes to bilateral agreements or arrangements with NATO allies, if in, if they need additional capabilities, if they would want that, um, then uh, we would work it out individually with each nation to, to make sure that we're meeting the need as, as, as best they, they desire and can accommodate. Uh, and some of those needs, uh, and again, I've said this before, will likely come from actually on the continent. You don't, you don't have to necessarily deploy from the states. Uh, but we want to keep as many options uh, available to us as possible. Uh, and, and a lot of that court will be, quite frankly, the decision about who goes and how many and where from will actually come from these discussions with the allies themselves. What do you need? What, what do you think, you know, what would be most helpful to you? And how fast do you need it? And how long do you want it? And all those kinds of things would be settled um, on an individual basis with, with each of these countries. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tony Capascio. Dan, I... I Hey, John, I just unmuted myself. Sorry. A uh, uh, question. Does the secretary or other defense officials have any concerns that Russia may actually move tactical nuclear missile units as a diplomatic messaging, for, for diplomatic messaging purposes, you know, new tactical nuclear weapons near the Ukraine or European allies? Has that come up at all? I haven't heard uh, discussions of that, Tony, what, what, but we watch closely, uh, as closely as we can, all the moves that uh, Mr. Putin is making militarily. And can you say with some confidence that you've got a, the U.S. has got a uh, handle on tactical nuclear weapons units that the Russians may or may not move? Going to talk about intelligence issues, Tony. I, I think you can understand that wouldn't be uh, wise for me to do from the podium. I can just tell you that we're watching this very, very closely, monitoring it as best we can, um, and, um, and and doing the best we can to make sure uh, that what context we do have, uh, that we're sharing it with our allies uh, and our Ukrainian partners as well. Uh, Sylvie. Hello. Um, hello, John. Um, can you tell us uh, how many U.S. troops are stationed today uh, in Poland and how many in Lithuania? I, I don't have that figure uh, here, uh, so I'm not going to guess. I'll take that question and we'll get back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, of course, it's a taking question. So as always, uh, and that should be a very simple, quick one to get for you. We'll shoot, shoot that around to everybody. Uh, Tara Kopp. Hi, John. Thanks for doing this. Um, so I have three questions. One, just a, a quick follow-up to Courtney and Jeff's question. These forces would be in addition to the 8,500, so potentially more than 8,500 U.S. troops would be dedicated to this. Second, can you give us a sense of 
if the 8,500 are sent, what they would be doing, we understand that they come from logistics and aviation and medical support, but if the NATO response force is not going into Ukraine, what would the 8,500 be doing to support the NATO response force? And then last question, Syria, um, can you give us an update on the prison outbreak and any sort of DOD estimates on how many ISIS fighters escaped? Uh, and would that necessitate potentially uh, more US troops to go in um, to round those ISIS fighters up? Thanks, I know that's a lot. Uh, okay, there's a lot there. Um, I don't have uh, an update for you on how many prisoners escaped versus how many were recaptured uh, by the SDF. I mean, I think um, I'd point you to inherent resolve uh, for more details about uh, that, uh, that operation. Um, again, our support was, was, uh, was fairly limited. So I just don't have that kind of level of uh, detail. Uh, on the 8,500, um, I, I think, again, what, all we've done here with this 8,500 is put them on prepare to deploy, and in some cases, uh, shorten their tether from like 10 days to five days. Uh, they haven't been given deployment orders. They are our, they represent uh, 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 a significant chunk of our contribution to the NATO response force. Um, we are keeping uh, all options open to, to provide the president the decision space. And so uh, if you're asking me, could the number of of uh, forces uh, put on PTDO or advanced PTDO uh, increase? The, the answer to that is yes, it, it could happen. Uh, and, and when and how we're able to, to speak to that, uh, that, that we will. Um, there could also be, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the movement of, of uh, U.S. forces that are already in Europe uh, uh, to eastern flank allies uh, at their request and at their invitation, that would not require the secretary to uh, necessarily put them on a shorter alertness posture. Maybe depending on who they are and where they're coming from, but not necessarily. So, um, if the question is, could it go? Could could, could troops being uh, put on a, a shorter tether go, go upwards of 8,500? The answer is yes, but uh, I, I don't have anything specific to speak to uh, about that. Uh, today, what we want to do is make sure that we are providing options to the president and to our allies uh, in case those options are, are needed to reinforce our commitment to the alliance. And then you ask me, what will they be doing if the NRF is activated? I think it was the question. Um, and as I said when we announced them, uh, there, there's a, a range of capabilities that that they that they uh, that they represent. Aviation, medical, logistics, certainly uh, uh, combat ground forces are included in that, in that list. And I, uh, we didn't go into every little detail of every little unit, but we did identify the major units that we were talking about and where they'd be coming from. Um, they they uh, provide a whole host of, uh, of military capabilities to the, to the NRF, but that's their focus is, is the NRF. And I won't speculate uh, about you know, if the NRF gets activated or if it doesn't, that's up to NATO to decide. And if it doesn't get activated, could uh, could some of these troops be used uh, to uh, in, in a bilateral way to, to bolster allies? Again, uh, all those are, are interesting academic exercises, but we're just not at that stage right now in order to be able to, to engage it. Uh, Paul Schinkman. My question was already asked. Thanks, John. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Jared from Al Monitor. Hi, Mr. Kirby. Thank you. Just wondering if you give us a little more background on uh, bringing Qatar into potentially bringing Qatar into in as a major non-NATO ally. Um, how long have these been dis these discussions been going on? Um, and uh, just yeah, wondering some context on that. Thanks. I'd, I'd point you to the alliance on that. That's not again. That's not an, a, a, U a U.S. call to make. Um, uh, that's really a better question put to the alliance. Uh, again, all the secretary was indicating was that you know that we support that process moving forward. Jason Bellini, Newsy. Okay, nothing heard. Uh, Paul McCleary. Hi, John. Um, Afghanistan is still a non-NATO, a major non-NATO ally. Is 
DOD, are you working with the Alliance to, to rescind that, that designation? I have not heard uh, any discussions to, to that effect. I'll, I'll take the question, though. I mean, um, I think it's a fair question we ought, to, we ought to look at, but I'm not aware of any such discussions. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Heather from uh, USNI. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of the um, carrier strike group that's under um, NATO's um, command right now, um, since it's the first time since uh, the Cold War, and given that the Pentagon didn't take these steps when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014 or during the 20 2008 con conflict between Russia and Georgia, what signal is the Pentagon hoping to send by putting the strike group under NATO? Well, I, I think uh, it sends a very strong signal about our commitment to the alliance. Um, I mean, this is a, it, it, it is very rare for a U.S. aircraft carrier strike group to be put under uh, under NATO command and control. Um, we think it's it's noteworthy. Certainly, um, uh, even without the exigent circumstances with respect to Ukraine, I mean, it, it, it it's a strong. A demonstration of, of how committed the United States is to to the alliance. Uh, certainly, when put in the context of what's going on, it um, I think it uh, again reinforces uh, what I said earlier about how seriously we take our Article Five commitments and our commitments to uh, our security commitments in, inside the alliance. So, um, I would think, I would hope uh, that the message to be taken away from this uh, is that NATO is a strong alliance. It is unified and the American commitment uh, to the NATO alliance is ironclad. Uh, Christina Anderson. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Poland has um, made some statements recently just uh, worrying about the uh, deployment of troops by Russia closer to their borders uh, on the Belarus side. Um, has there been any specific request on their part uh, for additional assistance, pending additional assistance, anything like that, that uh, you've received there? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, not uh, talk with great specificity as to the, the discussions we've been having with individual allies. I think you know uh, that the secretary spoke to his Polish counterpart last week. Uh, we're in constant and active discussions uh, uh, with Poland uh, about their concerns, what they're seeing, their perspectives, as well as um, uh, what, what capabilities uh, uh, they might require uh, uh, to help boost their own uh, defensive capabilities. Uh, and again, I don't have anything specific to read out with respect to any one country today. Rio? Oh, thank you, John. A quick follow-up about North Korea. <laughs> Uh, do you feel an urgency to increase military pressure on North Korea to deter future missile launches? Thank you. I think everybody uh, shares a, a sense of concern uh, over uh, the North Korean missile program uh, and their nuclear ambitions. And we are in active discussions uh, with, uh, with allies and partners in the region, as well as uh, UN member states, uh, about the best way to continue to respond to these provocations. It would, it would be um, enormously helpful if every nation that signed up to sanctions, for instance, actually implemented them and, um, and, and complied with them. Um, so there's, there's, there's still a lot of international work that, that needs to be done. And again, uh, without speaking to each specific uh, launch or um, uh, what we may know about each one, uh, I would tell you we're, we're watching this very, very closely, and we're going to continue here at the Pentagon to make sure that militarily we're ready to meet our uh, security commitments inside the alliance with the ROK. Yeah. As a matter of command and control, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, I understand that the 8,500 troops that will go as part of the response force will fall under NATO. The other troops that are being considered mm -hmm. unilaterally, do they, will they fall under European command? Is it just as a matter of? Yeah, most likely, most likely if it's a bilateral uh, arrangement that we have with uh, a country and, um, and we send U.S. troops to that country uh, to bolster their self-defense, uh, they would fall under General Walters and his European command commander hat. As opposed to General Walters and his NATO supreme uh, allies. Correct. That, that, would, that would be 
most likely that would be the arrangement. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.